Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello, my name is Saurabh Sharma and we are doing introduction to Chinese studies course. Today we are going to do lecture number 8, Century of Humiliation, Discourse on Imperialism, part 2. In the 7th lecture, we had done part 1 of this lecture. So, this is a map of the Qing dynasty. The Qing dynasty was a Manchu dynasty. Okay? So, their original homeland is this area, as you can see Manchuria. So, from here they expanded into this pink area okay, and build a very strong state. This is the Great Wall of China. The south of the Great Wall of China was the Ming dynasty. So, uh, the, the Manchus, they eventually in the, in the 17th uh, century, they captured the, uh, the rest of China. Okay, so, the Ming empire was eliminated and, and China became part of the, the Qing empire. The green parts are those territories like Taiwan and Tibet and Outer Mongolia, deep into Central Asia, okay, Xinjiang. All these provinces were gradually one by one captured by the Manchus. So, they built the largest Chinese empire perhaps after the, the Mongol empire. Okay. And Manchus are uh, very closely related ethnically with the Mongols. So, uh, Manchus and Mongols were uh, jointly the elite that ruled over China during the Qing dynasty period. There you can see there are some countries which are in light orange color, for example, Korea or Vietnam, Laos, even uh, Nepal, Burma, Siam. So, according to the Chinese view, these countries were part of the tributary system. Korea definitely was, uh, Vietnam also was. Other countries, it is it's a Chinese claim. From time to time, uh, they might have paid some tribute to China. For example, in case of Nepal, uh, there was a war between uh, Nepal and, and China because uh, the Gurkhas had invaded Tibet and to protect Tibet, the Chinese had sent their troops and they marched into Nepalese territory. And so, there was an agreement between them. And so, for a few years, Nepal pay, did pay tribute to the Chinese court. So, anyone in any point of history, if they had paid a tribute to the Chinese emperor, they claim it to be part of the Chinese tributary system. So, this was the might of the Qing empire and I have already told you about uh, Qianglong emperor okay, who, who refused to accept the offer made by uh, the McCartney mission uh, of uh, which was sent by uh, King George III. Now, at that time of course, that was 1793, uh, China was a mighty power. It was uh, in terms of population the largest uh, empire in the world. It also had the largest G GDP in the world, almost uh, more than 30 percent. But gradually, Chinese power began to decline relative to the Europeans because European powers were industrializing. Britain had already had uh, the first industrial revolution in the late 18th century. In the mid 19th century, Britain had the second industrial revolution. Now, the century of humiliation period starts in say you can say it starts with 1842 treaty of Nanjing, when the uh, Chinese were defeated by the British in the, in the first opium war and they signed a humiliating treaty of Nanjing. I have already given you uh, uh, the, uh, the details of those period, what were the various treaties and what happened. Let us look uh, briefly at, at the different rulers of China during that time, during this period of uh, the early part of the century of humiliation. Tao Kuang, the grandson of Qianglong, he was the emperor uh, during the first opium war. He was succeeded by his son Xianfeng, okay, who was the ruler of China during the second opium war when joint Anglo-French uh, forces, they defeated China and China again had to sign very humiliating treaties, not only with France and Britain, but also with America and Russia. Once uh, Xianfeng died, he was succeeded by his son, Thung Zhi. But uh, Thung Zhi was, uh, was a young, uh, young boy 
and therefore he, he, he could did not assume power directly. Instead, he was under the regency and one of the reasons was Dowager Sisi, his mother. Okay. So, Dowager Sisi during this period from 1861 on onwards was the most powerful political figure in China. She basically controlled the who will be the emperor of China and she, she even replaced emperors as a will and she did not give up power if, if when the emperor came of age, she did not give up power to them. She was supported by a group of very conservative civil servants, uh, the Mandarins, on whose advice she, she basically functioned. Now uh, let us see. So, Tung Shir by 1875 came of age and he decided to directly uh, play a role in, in the politics of China, but he was not very successful within a year he, he died and he was then replaced by Kuang Su. Kuang Su was not uh, his, his son because he, he died childless, he did not have a son. And so, Kuang Su was a nephew of Dowager Sisi, her sister's son. So, she made him the next emperor. And he was also a young boy, so he also did not exercise much power. When he came of age in uh, 1898, he tried to exercise power, he tried to reform China, but soon he was arrested and put under house arrest. Although he was the emperor of China for the next uh, 10 years, he was under house arrest and Dowager Sisi was basically running the government. And when Dowager Sisi was about to die, a day before she poisoned Kuang Su and Kuang Su died and uh, the next day she replaced him with Pui. Pui was 3 years old and he was made the emperor of China. The next day uh, Dowager Sisi died and uh, uh, Pui ruled uh, China for a few more years. He was known as the uh, Swangtong Emperor. Okay. So, he ruled for four, four more years and then in the Xinhai revolution, he was overthrown and Republic of China was established. So, throughout the period of all these rulers, China was declining. It was defeated by one by one by foreign powers who took more and more concessions from China and China practically became a semi-colonial state. Semi-colonial basically means that it was not fully colonized like India. India for example, was mostly ruled by the British while China mostly was under its own indigenous rule, but uh, in, in, in its coastal areas, uh, the foreign powers had their influence. Okay, so, this is a very, very famous cartoon published in 1898. So, this is uh, China is the pie here, you can see this is the pie China, this is, this is a French cartoon, so it is written in French and this pie is being shared by these different rulers. Okay, this is Queen Victoria, this is Kaiser William II, Tsar Nicholas II, okay, this is the representation of France, Marianne and this is a Japanese samurai. Okay, so, they are basically practically dividing China, splitting China among themselves. This is a Chinese Mandarin shouting and protesting. Okay, so, so, I have already discussed, so, but uh, let me show you in the map. So, basically uh, due to those unequal treaties, this whole area came under control of Russia. So, Russia was able to take over this area from China, also this part, this area. Okay, all these areas came under the control of Russia, uh, later on Soviet Union. So, Soviet Union uh, replaced Russia. Anyhow, so outer Mongolia again, this Russia made it an independent uh, country, Mongolia under its own, own uh, domination. Then the British from this, uh, this from Hong Kong all the way to Shanghai, it enjoyed control here. France, it controlled uh, Vietnam and Laos, this, in, this is called Indochina, this area was controlled by the French and also the southern parts of China were under its sphere of influence. Even the Germans played a role, Kaiser William as you saw in the cartoon. So, in Shangtong, Germany also establishes sphere of influence, but the biggest uh, share was taken by Japan. Okay, it, it annexed Korea completely, 1910, Korea became part of Japanese empire, Taiwan and these all these islands, this whole area was occupied by Japan and then Japan had its eyes on the rest of China. Okay, we shall see how Japan continues its policy of colonizing China. Okay, so, so, this is sharing the Chinese pie. Now, I have already discussed uh, these points, uh, beginning with the first opium war and all those treaties which uh, granted uh, different uh, uh, rights to the foreign powers. We discuss up to the situation in Tibet.
Okay, so Tibet here was very important for the British. Not because uh, say they had territorial ambitions in Tibet, because the British were afraid that you can see the Russian empire was expanding. Okay, it was moving towards the south. Okay, it was looking for a warm water access okay, towards Tibet and towards Afghanistan. So, as a part of the great game, the British wanted to stop the Russians from threatening their empire in India. And therefore, they decided to intervene in Afghanistan as well as in Tibet to stop the Russians from attacking India. And so, for this purpose, they, the British sent young husband expedition to Tibet where uh, they threatened the Dalai Lama who escaped from there and they, they, they were able to install some of their military assets there. And eventually after the collapse of the Qing empire, when China became republic and it was very weak, in 1914 there was a convention in Shimla in which uh, basically they demarcated the boundary be between their empire in India and Tibet. That is known as MacMahon line uh, today. But it also, uh, the co convention also divided Tibet into two parts, Inner Tibet and Outer Tibet. So, Inner Tibet was supposed to be directly under the jurisdiction of China, while Outer Tibet was supposed to be uh, de facto independent, but under the sovereignty of China. So, uh, China would be considered to be the sovereign power there, but they would have maximum autonomy and also protection from the British. So, the Chinese believe all these to be unequal treaties and therefore, you see China does not recognize the boundary between India and China. There is a dispute because China does not accept the validity of the Shimla convention. Although the Chinese representative who had come had initialed the treaty, but it was not ratified by the Chinese government. Okay. So, so, every treaty has to be ratified by the government and uh, so that was not done and therefore, China is not a signatory of the Shimla convention. Only the government of Tibet and the British Indian government were the signatories. Okay, so, we have done this. Now, so far what we have discussed, let us let us look at some of these concepts that we have discussed so far. The first is colonialism and imperialism. So, colonialism means when one country goes into another far off place, tries to settle its own people, establish uh, economic interest, military control and make that territory into its uh, own colony. Okay. That, that process is known as colonialism. In colonialism, the colonial power exploits the economic resources of the colony for its own benefit. As a result, the colony, uh, colony's economy, economy declines and the, the colonizer is enriched. That is the process of colonialism. Imperialism is the next stage when big empires are created. So, there are number of colonies which are administered through the imperial system. So, a viceroy, a governor general is appointed who rules over that particular territory. So, so there was the British empire, the French empire, so on and so forth, different European empires. So, this is known as imperialism. Then we also talked about uh, the great game. Okay, again, you must go to the map here. The great game was played between great powers. Okay. So, in Tibet and Afghanistan, it was between Russia and Britain and Britain did well, it, it was able to stop Russia from interfering in Afghanistan and Tibet. But for a few decades, the Russian threat was re very real for the British. Similarly, there was uh, this conflict between Russia and Japan. I told you that Russia occupied this territory in Manchuria. Now, Japan also wanted to have its power in Manchuria. So, Vladivostok is somewhere here, which is an important port and military naval base for the Russians. Okay, so the Japanese fell uh, threatened by it. Okay, it, and, and and so that eventually led to the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, when Russia was defeated by Japan, and uh, it was able to extend its influence into Manchuria at the cost of the Russians. Okay, so so the, the, the all these contests between great powers is known as the Great Game. The other uh, uh, important concept is heartland versus maritime strategies. Heartland uh, refers to a strategy based on land based army, land based weapons and expanding your land territory. So, countries like say Germany and uh, Russia primarily had an heartland strategy. They wanted to protect their own country. As a result, they wanted to create buffer between themselves and other great powers by expanding more and more, capturing more and more territory, thus securing the heartland. 
On the other hand, maritime strategy is a naval strategy. So the great naval powers like Britain or before them the Dutch or the Portuguese and Spain and the French, they had very powerful navies. So their own territory was very small, it was limited. But they expanded their power by going into different parts of the world and colonizing them. So that is the maritime strategy. Japan also because its, its land is also limited, also followed a maritime strategy. And often what happens in geopolitics is a maritime power comes into conflict with a heartland power. So the, so the British Empire coming in conflict with the German Empire or the Japanese coming in conflict uh, with uh, uh, as I told you Russian Empire or, the, or China. China was also a heartland uh, uh, empire or in the Cold War it was Soviet Union versus the Americans. Americans followed a maritime strategy because within their own continent America was not threatened. Okay, they were safe. It was overseas that the Americans fought against the Soviets, while the Soviets were fighting in the territories around themselves. Okay, so, so that is the heartland and maritime strategy. So in this, Japan was the maritime power which colonized parts of China which was the heartland power. Next unequal treaties. Unequal treaties are those treaties which are signed by a, a strong state and a weak state. So when a state is very weak. If you force that uh, state to sign a treaty and concede a lot of things to them, these are known as unequal treaties. So according to the Chinese, all these treaties that were signed during the century of humiliation, like Treaty of Nanjing or Bog or Wampua or Wangxia or the Tianjin treaties or the Convention of uh, Peking and so all these treaties are, are, are the biggest one was Treaty of Shimonoseki. Okay. So all these treaties are considered to be unequal treaties because at that time China was weak. China unwillingly gave up a lot of things to foreign powers. Okay. So, so these are called unequal treaties. Once China became uh, stood on its own, it rejected all the unequal treaties and said that they will not accept them. Then uh, we talked about treaty ports. Okay. Treaty ports are those uh, ports which uh, were given to foreign powers by China where the foreigners come and do business. And in these treaty ports, there was ex extraterritoriality that, uh, for example, there is a British subject, uh, that subject won't be governed by Chinese laws. So although that subject is living in China, the law governing them will be British laws and they will be judged by British judges, not by Chinese judges or Chinese government cannot prosecute them. Only the British government can do. Same for the French, same for the Russians, Americans. Such treaty ports were created all over China. If you remember the the first five treaty ports were Canton, Amoy, Fuzhou, Ningpo and Shanghai okay, which are given to the British by the Chinese. So these are treaty ports. Extraterritoriality I have already explained. Then another thing the foreign powers asked for was most favored nation status that they will be given very good uh, trade deal and no other country will be given a better deal than them. So most favored nation status these days is applicable in WTO. If you are a member of WTO, you offer um, uh, most favored nation status to other members of WTO. This is a, a kind of a practice of free trade. So wherever there is free trade, there has to be most favored nation status. The number eight is fear of influence. So these great powers in these great games, they preyed upon smaller states and created sphere of influence. So sphere of influence means that particular area is not directly ruled by the great power, but whatever government it has is not completely independent. It, it, it is subject to the will of the great power. Okay, so say, say for example Korea. So Korea was under the sphere of influence of the Chinese empire till 1895 when they surrendered Korea and gave it to Japan and it came under Japanese sphere of influence. 1910 Japan annexed Korea. Till 1910 it was under its sphere of influence or say Indochina. Indochina was under the Chinese sphere of influence. France then after the war with China, they brought Indochina under their own sphere of influence. So this is the concept of sphere of influence or say Tibet being uh, the sphere of influence of the British. Okay, so, so here we have understood uh, these different concepts. Now how did the Chinese respond to imperialism? They were defeated one by one by different powers. So were they ready to change? So they adopted certain policies. The first was the self-strengthening movement. This was adopted in 
1861 after the convention of Peking when they were defeated by, uh, by these foreign powers, they realized that they have to westernize. Okay, so, they started ad, uh, importing foreign machines, they established factories, weapon factories, they started adopting uh, western training for their military. Okay, and so, there was an attempt to completely change the way uh, military is organized in China, but they did not change the culture. So, basically the, in the self-strengthening movement they said culture will remain the same, so they will continue to follow the Confucian system. With the, with the civil service exam and all that, but technologically they will learn from the West. So, they divided uh, this um, the whole learning process into two, Te technical education from the West, but cultural education from, from China. In fact, uh, self strengthening movement was uh, quite useful for some time. Uh, Prince Kung was one of the most uh, important supporters of this uh, and because of his efforts, you know the large number of people were able to work on this and the number of factories came up and so on. Eventually, Prince Kung, his power declined in the Chinese court. As a result, self strengthening movement began to lose support. Ultimately, uh, when Japan defeated China within 6 months and China could not win a, even a single battle against Japan, it was completely humiliated. That basically sidelined all the supporters of self strengthening movement. So, the conservatives they, in the court, they are led by Dowager Sisi they argued that the westernization plans have all failed and therefore, we must return to the old ways. Okay. For example, Li Hung Chang who was an important supporter of self strengthening movement, he was sent to Shimonoseki to sign the treaty with Japan and he was in, in the bargaining he, he lost a lot and, uh, and, and so, once he returned he was humiliated, his, his power declined. In fact, some people considered it to be an insult to be called Li Hung Chang. Okay. So one of the important uh, uh, institutions of the self strengthening movement was Tsung Li Yamen. Tsung Li Yamen was the foreign ministry of China or say the whoever was the head of this institution was considered to be equal to uh, the post of prime minister. They basically dealt with all the foreign powers. Okay. So, this movement lasted for about uh, 3 decades. Then the conservatives took hold. Now, at that time some young radical thinkers also emerged. For example, Kang Yo Wei and his student Liang Chi Chao. Okay, so, these were uh, uh, very radical thinkers, they want to, wanted to liberalize China, wanted to make it into a westernized kind of a constitutional monarchy with universities, modern schools, modern way of life and so on and so forth. And Emperor Kuang Su by that time had come of age, it is 1898 and he decided to take power in his own hands and he introduced what, what is known as 100 days reform supported by the reformers. But Daoja Sisi was not happy with this and after 100 days he was arrested and the reformers were all executed except uh, Kang Yo Wei and Liang Chi Chao because they escaped to Japan. But others who were uh, in China were all arrested and executed by uh, the conservatives. Unfortunately for the conservatives, the situation was worsening and after the boxer uh, rebellion when, when China was again humiliated by, by the invasion of eight nations, even the conservatives decided that it is time for reforms. And so, Dawaja Sisi and uh, uh, upcoming uh, military leaders like Yuan Shikai, they started reforming the Qing government, but it was too late and uh, the whole Confucian system had collapsed, it had failed and uh, the, the civil service exams were abolished, but eventually the Qing dynasty was overthrown in 1911. By 1912, China became a republic. So, let us look at the uh, situation after China became a republic. So, in 1914, the first world war broke out. So, Germany was the enemy, um, uh, Japan joined the allies, so they joined the Brit Britain, so they were an ally of Britain in the first world war and Japan attacked Germany in Shantung province. I have mentioned, already mentioned that in Shantung in 1898, Germany had acquired some territory. So, the Germans uh, were defeated by Japan and uh, Japan take, took over Shantung province. After that, 1915, Japan made 21 demands on the Chinese government, which basically meant that China would become a colony of Japan. Okay, they were not satisfied with, with 
whatever they had uh, conquered, they, they wanted more. And uh, the Chinese government was so much under pressure that they succumbed. They were not able to resist the Japanese because they were afraid that there will be another war and Japan will again humiliate them. And in fact, uh, in the Republican period, China was, China had basically, central government had lost control over China and China had gone into the warlord period. Different territories were controlled by different warlords and the central government had no control over them. And so China was very, very weak. And therefore, they succumbed to the 21 demands, especially in Manchuria, where, where Japan was able to, uh, you know, get a lot of rights in economic rights and infrastructure and the right to send their army there. Uh, in fact, they created a whole new army known as the Kwantung army, okay, which was meant for fighting in Manchuria. The response was, uh, you know, the, the May 4th movement, 1919. This is uh, basically after the Treaty of Versailles. So once Germany was defeated, the victors of the war, the First World War, met in Paris. So the, there they signed the Treaty of Versailles. And in this treaty, the German territory of China was handed over to Japan by the allied powers. And the Chinese were very upset because Chinese also were allies of, of the British, Americans and all the, the other side. But they were helpless. And so uh, students came out on the streets protesting on 4th of May 1919, demanding complete transformation of China, that China should completely change its way of life. It should adopt science instead of Confucianism and adopt democratic system of government, okay, so that the government is responsible to the people. Of course, this movement was suppressed, but uh, in terms of ideas, it had become very popular. And an important progress was the formation of the Kuomintang. Kuomintang was a political party in China established by Sun Yat-sen. Okay, Sun Yat-sen established the Kuomintang. He already was participating in the Republican movement. In fact, he was one of the leaders of the, the 1911 revolution. But he had been sidelined by Yuan Shikai and other uh, powerful uh, military leaders. Now, Sun Yat-sen believed in three principles of the people. Okay, that is nationalism, democracy and socialism or people's livelihood, different uh, translations. And uh, after Sun Yat-sen died, the Kuomintang movement was then led by his successor, Chiang Kai-shek. So this was basically a culmination of the nationalist movement, republican movement within China. The other stream of protest was the communist movement. Okay, so some of the people were actually influenced by the Russian revolution of 1917 and they thought a similar revolution should happen in China and China should completely uproot all the old traditions that were still prevalent in China, just like Russia did through the communist revolution. Okay, they were not happy with the reforms that Kuomintang or the liberals were suggesting. So in 1921, the Communist Party of China was formed, led by Chan Tu Shu, okay, who was the first general secretary, and Li Ta Chao. There was some difference between them, but that is not uh, important from for today's lecture's point of view. Of course, eventually, one leader emerged in the Communist Party of China, who became the most powerful leader, the paramount leader, that is Mao Tse Tung. The communist uh, revolution was basically based on Marxism, Leninism principles. Okay, let us see what happened after that. So, 1921, uh, the communist movement. So, uh, this was a period uh, in the 1920s when uh, there was a lot of flux. So, the Kuomintang and the communists came together to revive China. Okay, and, and the Soviet Union had suggested that because Soviet Union now was in interfering in the politics of China and they advised the members of the Communist Party of China to join the Kuomintang and together participate in the national movement so that China is free from all the foreign influence and emerges as a strong state. But Chiang Kai-shek was suspicious of the communist because obviously the communists were also under foreign influence, not the American, British or French influence, but the Soviet influence. And therefore, he in 1928 launched a crackdown on the communists. And so there is a split between the Kuomintang and the communists. Now, taking ad advantage of that situation, Japan now decides to annex Manchuria completely. Instead of getting those rights, whatever they had been given, they decide to invade Manchuria and capture it. And this happened in 1931. So the Kwantung army, which was already there in, in Manchuria, defeated China after a minor incident, which was a, a, actually a false flag, uh, the Mukden incident. They defeated China and captured the whole of Manchuria and they declared formation of the state of Manchukuo. Okay, Manchukuo. Manchu means the people of, of Manchuria, Kuo means 
country. So, Manchu Kuo means country of the Manchus. And they invited the last Chinese emperor, Pu Yi, to be the emperor of Manchu Kuo, the puppet emperor. Okay, basically, Japanese were the rulers, real rulers, but he was installed as the emperor. And Pu Yi and, uh, was uh, obviously overthrown in Beijing, and so he was living in, in exile. And so he took that opportunity and accepted the position of the, the ruler of Manchu Kuo. Meanwhile, I have already told you about the Soviet invasion of uh, Xinjiang. So, uh, many of these territories were taken over. Then in 1937, Japan was still not satisfied because Japan had now these problems with, with the League of Nations, which was an international organization led by the British and the French. And they had begun to criticize Japan. But Japan was not listening to those criticisms. They had uh, bigger ambitions. And uh, in fact, uh, I was talking about the sphere of influence. So, Japan had a plan of creating a greater East Asian uh, co-prosperity sphere, greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. So, their plans included controlling the whole of East Asia up to South Asia, even India was supposed to be under their sphere of influence in this grand plan. So, as, as the first part of this plan, they invaded China in 1937. So, the Second World War began in Asia two years before Europe. In Europe, Second World War began in 1939 when Germany invaded Poland. But in, in Asia, it had already begun with the Japanese invasion of China in 1939. Seven. And I will not talk about what happened in the Second World War, it is a, it's a well known story. Um, eventually, Japan and Germany, initially they were successful, but eventually they lost out to the might of the British Empire and Americans and the Soviets all coming together. It was too much for Japan and Germany and they were on the verge of defeat. At that time, in 1943, British and Americans, they gave up all their extraterritorial rights in China. So, they signed agreements with the Chiang Kai-shek government, the nationalist Kuomintang government and gave up their extraterritorial rights. So, according to Kuomintang, that is the time when century of humiliation came to an end. Of course, the world war continued till 1945 when Japan was defeated. Japan surrendered and China became independent. But soon, it entered into a civil war between Kuomintang and communists. So, according to the communist, century of humiliation comes to an end not in 1943, but in 1949, when the People's Republic of China is established. 1st of October 1949, the communists capture almost entire China except for Taiwan and some islands nearby. So, the Republic of China government, so there are two governments in China. One is People's Republic of China, that is a communist government. Then there is a Republic of China, which was led by Chiang Kai-shek. So, they went to Taiwan and their government.